Hi everyone. Before we begin, I just want to let everybody know that I had a lot of difficulty um, recording this this week um, between some troubles with my computer that kept crashing and, you know, just my cell phone unfortunately not being able to keep up with everything. I actually ended up recording this three times and then when I went to edit it, a part of it was entirely missing. So I ended up piecing things together from the different recordings. So I apologize if it seems a little choppy and, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what happened, but I did just want to get the episode out. So I will talk to you all soon and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Danger on Delmarva. This is a podcast and video that explores the tragedies and disasters that have occurred on the Delmarva Peninsula, an area in the Mid-Atlantic region that encompasses Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. My name is Rhonda Franny Jefferson, and I'll be your host today as we start to travel down some of the treacherous and winding roads that are on Delmarva. Now, a lot of people see Delmarva as a little piece of heaven. We have beautiful beaches that seemingly go on forever, tax-free shopping in Delaware, one of the very best children's hospitals in the world, and of course, it's home to the current President of the United States. Now, this episode is going to be recorded as both a podcast and a video. So, you know, depending on whichever way you would like to listen to it, you can do it through any of the podcast apps or the YouTube channel, which will be listed in the description. Um, please excuse me if I use the terms podcast and video interchangeably, because right now I'm just getting used to that. Um, later on, I'll probably get used to saying episode. Um, now, before we begin, I do want to give an update on something that I've covered recently, the disappearance of Woody Dickerson. Now, things have started to take a little bit of a confusing turn on this. Um, apparently, his wife did hear from him around November 1st, even though she said the very next day on social media that she hadn't. Now, she says it's a misunderstanding as to what actually occurred, but what has been shown on some of the, the media outlets that I've seen is that a neighbor um, saw Woody um, at his mother's house, and the neighbor knew that he was missing, um, found a flyer with the phone number on it, and called Trish, the wife, and she was actually out front of her mother-in-law's house at that time with her mother-in-law. So what ended up happening is, you know, the neighbor spoke with her. She saw some interaction or what she believed to be, to be some type of interaction between everyone as Trish and the mother-in-law did go around to about the same area that he was. Um, at some point, Trish drove back to, um, where he was and whether or not he got into the car or not, the neighbor said she couldn't tell because of, you know, the location and corners, plus the vehicle's windows were tinted. But the next day after this, um, tr um Trish said on social media that she had not heard from him in a month. But if she, you know, even just saw him, even if no words were exchanged, at least, you know, that should have been acknowledged on social media, in my thoughts at least, even if for whatever reason they weren't able to have a conversation. But, you know, I don't know the specifics as I was not there. The neighbor did have a picture of him standing outside of the house, as well as um, you know, her call log showing that she did call the numbers. So there's kind of a lot going on in this case. And if I hear anything more, I will be sure to update.
Now to our episode today. I hope no one minds if I take a little bit of time to just kind of set the scene a little bit and talk about one of my favorite places on earth. Um, I also, if you've listened before, I do tend to describe an area or a location sometimes a lot. Uh, I do like to kind of set the feel of where we'll be. So today's historical tale will be taking us to Chincoteague, Virginia. Now, I have some of the fondest memories of my life there. The beaches are so welcoming that you don't even mind getting sand everywhere. Now, just on the beaches on Delmarva in general, dolphins can be occasionally found leaping off the coast in the distance. Now, I've been fortunate to see them sometimes up and down the coast. And what I really love seeing, though, is the Chincoteague wild ponies that roam the beach. Um, so they actually roam in a lot of different areas. Um, there's the National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a lot of areas that are cordoned off, so you can't actually go in there. But sometimes they will approach a vehicle or on the, the nature walk. Um, one may come up to a person, but really we're just visitors there. It's their home, so we really have to be careful. We're not supposed to approach the ponies if you do happen to visit. I did do an episode earlier where I discussed the death of one of these ponies. Now, the main origination theory of these ponies on Chincoteague is that they survived a shipwreck and made it to the island. They've adapted to their surroundings and they've actually kind of created their own breed. So there is that breed of the Chincoteague pony. Now, as with many small populations of animals, we have to be very concerned about their future. So even though I do love watching them, it's best for me and best for everyone if we don't approach them. Um, but again, they are gorgeous. Um, you know, there was also an incident uh, a couple of years ago where you know, the ponies did go on to a publicly accessible area onto the beach on the Assateague, Maryland side because there's the Assateague shoreline um, in Maryland and Virginia, but this was in the Maryland side and I will make sure to put a map up so you have a better understanding. And the horse or pony, should, he actually went up to the blanket and was kind of sniffing her food and so she did what, you know, I don't think many people would have done and she hit him with a shovel. Now, I don't know if it was just one of the small digging shovels. Um, all of the articles say shovels, but I'm not sure if that's you know, just to embellish it a little bit. But either way, she hit a pony who was really on his home turf. Um, so he kicked her. So she was really very lucky she didn't get seriously hurt, but she was blasted by the internet. Um, now for Chincoteague overall, there's usually around less than 3,000 year round residents, but there are a lot of visitors in the summer. I have a lot of memories with my family there. Um, we would go there in the summers and the beaches, just the whole atmosphere really lends to a sense of peace and almost a sense of home, even if you don't live there. Um, I would go down there by myself um, sometimes and my mom would worry about me, but it really felt safe. Now to again, kind of describe the location. And I think this will be important to show the remoteness um, you know, once we get into the story, Chincoteague the town is a town on Chincoteague Island. It's on Virginia's eastern shore of the region. And for me, I would have to drive about two hours to get there. And about one and a half hours is your highway, highway bypasses, going down through local towns where you have to make sure you're going the exact speed limit or under. Because as a warning, everybody, if you do visit, you will get stopped. So, public service announcement, but once you get past all of those areas, it's about 30 minutes of absolute driving bliss. There's Wallops Island, that's actually a NASA flight center, and then a visitor center on the other side of the road. As soon as my kids were old enough to appreciate that, we made a visit there and still have great memories. Now, the town of Chincoteague leads into the Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. 
that's on Assateague Island. And again, I know this is getting confusing, so you know, I will try to make sure everything is clear within um, the map. So, you know, within that um, refuge, there is also the lighthouse. It's the Assateague Lighthouse. You know, so it's very, very close to the actual town of Chincoteague. And this lighthouse, you know, of course, served a very important purpose for, you know, leading sailors and their ships into um, the port. Now the lighthouse is 142 feet tall. Um, you can get to it either by Chincoteague Island, um, which is going over the Assateague Channel. Um, and there's a couple bridges, one in Maryland side, one kind of going through another part of Maryland. Um, it is owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and operated by the Coast Guard. And it's still actually used today to some extent. I did get to climb up to the top one time, and it's not open, I don't believe, right now, but if you ever get a chance, if you visit, I would do that. And it also recently went through some renovations, and the old, you know, lighthouse keepers' quarters, they're actually used now for seasonal employees that work there during the summer. The summer's there as well as going into the fall. It can sometimes be a little stormy um, during hurricane season, so times like that. And I'm hoping to do an episode on how some of the coastal shore, shore, sorry, coastal storms actually help shape the island, both figuratively and literally. I've already started to research those, um, which, you know, if theory is correct about the ponies, it could be during one of those storms. So now we have a feeling of what Chincoteague is like. So let's get into the story. So next we're going to explore the struggles of young love, of a young man who's trying to win the approval of not only his future intended bride, but that of her parents. It's really a story as old as time. And at the time of this event in the late 19th century, it was very important to get the bride's parents' appro approval. So when the approval of the parents is not and cannot ever be won, some people may feel that they have to take drastic measures in order to be with their soulmate. But then what happens if that soulmate doesn't want to be with them either? That puts a whole new spin on things and it changes the trajectory of a story. Now, this man in this story, he knew that he would never win the approval of his love's parents. And that way he didn't really hold much hope of spending the rest of his life with her. So at some point he must have decided that unless he takes decisive action, going against everyone's wishes, he would never be with her for eternity. But he didn't really understand that if he loved her, he would let her go and let her live her dreams in the way that she wanted to. But no, Tom Freeman would not give up and he would do whatever it took to be with Jenny Hill for eternity. So also, as we'll see at this time, there was not instant access to news. And even if news made it to the other areas of the country, accuracy could not always be guaranteed. Now, some of the specifics of the actual events may have some discrepancies so wherever I see them, I'll make sure that I make note of that, but the motivation and the outcome remains the same. So as far as the people involved in this event, there's not a lot of information about the individuals. Now, Tim Hill Jr. is one of the parents that we're talking about. Um, the only thing we knew about him, other than he himself was a very prominent person on the island, um, it's thought that his father actually survived a shipwreck as well to make it to the island. So eventually I may do a story about the storms and wrecks around the area because that would be very interesting. Now, there is some information about Tom Freeman, who was our young man in the story. His mother died when he was young at around five years old. He was born in Chincoteague in 1865 and his mother died in 1870. His father did remarry and they moved to Berlin, which is a town that's across the border in Maryland. You know, now it wouldn't take tremendously long to get there. 
but then it, it probably was a little bit of a trek. Now, eventually, after his father did pass away, he moved back to Chincoteague. So with the Hill family and Tom Creeman, things started it out, started out just innocently enough. The Hill family needed help on their farm and Freeman needed a job. This happens every day around the world, even today. But in 1885, it may have even needed more help than today since there wasn't, you know, all of the equipment that we have for farming now. But what Tim Hill didn't know is hiring this young man would change the course of his family's lives. Seemingly right away, Freeman found that Jenny was irresistible. And it's going to make me cringe to say these words. Jenny was 13. So he started to ask his employers, employers for the permission to court her. Now, Cindy Faith, who was the director of the Chincoteague Museum, said, quote, he was in love with Jenny. He asked her parents repeatedly if he could court her, and they said no. Faith also continued to add that they possibly could have gotten married um, if it wasn't for Tom Freeman's social standing. Jenny's parents wanted her to marry someone of a higher status so that he could support her. So it came down to the family not seeing how Freeman could actually support their daughter, so they said no. Again, this is another thing that makes me cringe, that the first response of the parents is not that their 13-year-old daughter is in this man, this much older man's you know, sights. But after so many no's to his request, Freeman decided to leave and he got work on a light ship. Now, if things only could have ended there, but they didn't. Now, just aside on the light ships, Think of it as a lighthouse with a hull. It's basically taking the principle of a lighthouse, making it mobile, mobile, and it helps lead ships safely into port. Now, for Freeman and Hill, you know, there were future interactions. Freeman um, you know, was on the boat, but Hill needed help still. So he managed to coax Freeman back, which meant Freeman, deciding he still wanted to be with the object of his affection, move back to the farm. This was dangerous naivety on Mr. Hill's part. There was just no way in his mind that he could ever imagine things would happen the way they did. So of course Freeman continues to ask for, for um, the Hill's blessing. Again, they, they just keep denying it. And in June 1885, he was starting to reach his breaking point. He began to write letters to the Hill family, to friends, and they just showed his overall hang anguish of the situation. I'm going to put the wording up um, on whichever side it fits best so that you can see um, you know, what the letter was like. So just bear with me. I'm going to pull up the letter. Oh, I'm sorry. You can probably see that. And there was actually some articles that mentioned the actual wording and flow of the letter when discussing the situation as well. Um, there were some mistakes that were made throughout the letter, so um, that's why I'm going to put the wording up so that you could see everything. It said, Dear Sir, to all the people in the world, I will tell you that I have died for love. I am going to kill myself on a count, Jenny Hill. We have been courting about eight mount, and this is the last. I will die and I will kill my lover, so goodbye to all and to everybody. This is my request to be very long a side of here. You know, so like I said, an article mentioned his lack of spelling and grammar skills, so I will actually talk about this a little bit later on. But on the morning of June 18th, 1885, um, Freeman just kind of hit his breaking point. And this is where we start to see some of the conflicting information. Um, now, one article said that at the time of the event, Jenny and her mother were coming back from a dressmaker. Others say that Freeman approached them while they were on their way to do an errand. But either way, Freeman shot Jenny wounding her with one shot into the ear and another in her neck. This information seems pretty consistent, but her mother, Zipporah, information says that she was either shot in her
her ear, I'm sorry, in her stomach or in her head. But there's, you know, there's not really a way to tell as it was kind of split as to um, where she was shot. But she did survive. Um, the two did start to go towards neighbors, but the neighbors had heard the shots and they came out to help. Freeman must have felt that he had, you know, accomplished his goal and he went to another building on the property and shot himself. Somehow Zipporah managed to survive, um, which during a time without modern surgical equipment, um, the ability to keep germs away, and even just to have access to a surgeon, you know, in that small island in a remote place, you know, she must have been in agony. And not only physically because of the wounds, but because of her daughter emotionally. Poor Jenny lingered on for about 12 hours. She was said to have felt that everything was her fault and kept apologizing. And we know that this was not her fault. Cindy Faith did also say everyone in the family said she died of a broken heart. To add to the tragedy, one of Jenny's brothers witnessed the shooting, so he saw his mother and his sister shot. This crime also took the innocence of not only Jenny, but the whole community. One article regarding the incident said that, and I quote, Jenny was perfect, was a perfect blonde of a bright and happy disposition, who was in every case the pet of the entire family, the most loving and obedient of them, end quote. Now later the writer, writer describes the funeral and here he says, the corpse was laid out in the parlor, the drilling wrapped in a white robe strewn with flowers, the golden hair that only the day before was all disheveled and clotted with gore was tastefully arranged and if possible, she looked more beautiful in death than in life. In one corner of the room stood her organ opened upon which rested the last piece of music she played. Loving hands bore her to the family burying ground a few yards away from where the fatal shots were fired. She was also described as her father's favorite child. Now to add insult to injury, if you'll recall from the letter, Tom had asked to be buried next to her. Um, we do have some historical record about his burial, but not complete. However, I think we can all be pretty assured in that they were not buried together. His body was not treated with care. His mother and his father had both passed, but none of the remaining family members would claim his body. The casket that he was put in was described as a rude pine box, and he was originally buried next to his deceased mother. Later, though, Freeman was disinterred and buried somewhere else, but where, we don't know. The thoughts are that he's either buried in an unmarked grave in Ridge Cemetery, while others think he's in the churchyard of St. Andrew's Catholic Church. At the time, it was a Methodist church. Now, as for the legacy of this case, we'll hear, of course, about the supernatural, that some people report ghostly you know, sightings in that area, just like we usually hear when there's tales of premature death or murder or suicide. Now, the Hills House does still exist, but it's been on two different locations on the property. And in one of the articles that I could find where this was actually mentioned, it does seem though it's in a different location than at the time of the event. It was bought by someone in 2000, I'm sorry, 1980, and at the time it was really ramshackle, but they did fix it up. But people still talk of Jenny, whose life was ended before it began, who walks the halls dreaming about her dreams that were never fulfilled. She laments on her stolen life. So with the stories that I like to share on this channel, I look for things that we can learn from them. But in this case, I think it's more a matter of seeing what we've already learned between this time and when the murder happened. So there's a lot of time in between there and we've learned quite a bit. Now to discuss some of my thoughts on certain aspects of the case, you know, in current times, we would recognize that his behavior was obsess obsessive. So Jenny's parents would probably have not allowed him to come back to the farm. Um, you know, no matter how much help that they actually needed. And, you know, at 
at this point in time, I do have to remind myself that this was in 1885. And to some degree, people were more trusting. They also didn't understand the mentality of obsession or stalking. But then sometimes I think I just tell myself this so that, you know, I just don't dwell on the fact that these parents were letting this man who kept asking to court their very young daughter, but yet they still felt comfortable enough to come back to the farm or have him come back to the farm. Now, you know, even if he had come back and continued to persist in this obsession right now, in today's time, you know, we probably would have called the police, would have sought orders of protection, but 1885, you know, I don't know if the police or the judiciary would even know how to approach that. Um, you know, at the time of the story, most people would have tried to handle things themselves. But today we would look at these actions and know that they were that of a stalker. And when we hear that word, we automatically cringe. You know, it's almost this feeling of instinctive fear. We don't want to be in the crosshairs of someone who is obsessed with us. Now, we know that that title, stalker, is sinister, but in 1885, the word was really used in, though it was the same meaning, a kind of different context. Um, the first thing I thought of was um, Sherlock Holmes. He had what was called the deerstalker hat, and it was basically, you know, the word stalking would be used in hunting, you know, trying to hunt a deer, a moose for food, because at that time, that was a main source of sustenance as well as using the pelts to you know, try to stay warm. So they would stalk to hunt to survive. So even though Tom Freeman was stalking Jenny, the word to them wouldn't mean anything. And even if they heard it, it would mean something different, but the same. Now, what about when Tom left the farm to go on the light ship? ship. To me, at least, eh, I would not want to have been on the ship. I would have rather worked at the farm. Now, I'm not saying that working on a farm isn't very taxing work. It's probably a matter of perspective. Um, but me personally, I am just extremely cold all the time and I keep my room at 80 degrees. So the thought of being on this boat in the winter is just a horrible prospect to me. Plus, you know, the aspect of the danger of possibly falling overboard, drowning, or even freezing in a winter storm. But Tom did go, and I almost wonder if he did that just to get, the, get away from the situation, understanding that he could not be around Jenny. If so, this does show that he recognized that his desire for Jenny was unhealthy, and he would have seen that it was unhealthy to him in the way that it made him feel. So the lack of relationship that he had with Jenny caused him pain. I can only speculate that this must have seemed like torture for him. And I almost wonder if in his mind, this was being done to emotionally torture him. So him being asked back to the farm was being done to um, cause him pain, at least in his mind. So the resentment would have built up. Now, going back to the letters that I mentioned, um, there was one article where it seemed like it was trying to show him having a chaotic mind, even comparing him to Jack Nicholson's character in The Shining. But we have to remember, again, the time period there, there was not as much formalized education. And even if he did have access to that, he was very young when both of his parents died and most likely would have had to go straight into work. So... I don't think much can be said really about, you know, the grammar and the punctuation. It was that time period and he had left, most likely, um, left schooling to go to work. So the fact that other things were thought out very clearly, that he wrote the letters, that he waited for, you know, for Jenny to come home or at least to be leaving, he had things planned. So to me... It's not a chaotic mind. It's just, unfortunately, he wasn't able to either finish school or have that much schooling. And, you know, that was reflected in his writing. 
Now, also in this time, there really were a lot of things that were romanticized, and we can see that about Jenny's description in the journalism of the day. So along those same lines, I have to wonder if Tom romanticized death. You know, so this was like a Romeo and Juliet where only Romeo was in love. So, you know, like I said, someone had actually compared him to Jack Nicholson in The Shining. But, you know, really the, the comparisons maybe were that they were a predator. You know, um, I think we need to look at the letters that he wrote and look at them more for the substance of what they were trying to say compared to the actual grammar. So, can we say that Tom's actions caused chaos? Yes, we can. But just because they cause chaos, it does not necessarily mean that an instigator's thoughts were disordered. So thoughts and ideas can be completely thought out and using the reason that that certain person is using. So most people would never understand that reasoning, but some do. So currently we understand that stalking like this exists. And we know that some people, no matter what, will never let others go. Our system today is in no means perfect, but it does offer some protection as compared to the absolutely none in Jenny's day. You know, we have a better understanding of the human psyche and even people without training in the field have an almost sixth sense that a person's behavior is not right. Now, Personally, I also see somewhat of a correlation in the fact that in 1885, women were mostly seen as an extension of their male relatives. Today, that isn't so. You know, women fulfill their dreams. They can go to college, have you know, more education. They're not just relegated to be someone's wife or mother. So I think that has helped with the realization currently that there needs to be laws and protections um, for women, whereas back then, it, you know, when women were being treated really as not a full citizen, so to say, you know, it just wasn't given that much importance. Now, also, you know, going back to the articles and romanticizing Jenny, you know, she was described by her looks at first. You know, they were in absolutely glowing terms, and. I know that's done when people do pass away. It just kind of struck me that the first thing he described was her looks. Um, you know, Jenny here, she was a girl in a time where her own ambitions would not have been really followed. They would have been discounted for the ambitions or the dreams of her father and later her husband. And, you know, to be clear, I'm not saying that the lack of rights led to this tragedy. But what I'm saying is, you know, today we see women more equally. So here ends our tragic tale of Jenny Hill. But because now that the story is over, I don't want to give the perpetrator any more attention. We can sit back and lament on what was lost, wonder whether or not Jenny would have sought and fulfilled her dreams outside of Chincoteague, or would she have stayed? Would she and her children, would they have maybe changed the world in ways that we can't even imagine. We'll just never know, thanks to the obsession of this dangerous young man towards a very young girl. So thank you everyone for sticking to the end. I actually think this may end up being one of my shorter episodes. You know, usually I like to take a really deep dive if I can, um, just to get the most understanding out of a case. But some things were limited to find from this time period. Now, what we can find at least some comfort is in is that there is now an understanding or more of an understanding of this behavior than there was before. Now, I just want to mention that all of my sources will be in the description of the episode notes. Um, you know, I will put some of the links to the pictures or articles too, you know, if you wanted to see um, some of the things, um, you know, if you're listening it listening to this as a podcast and not a video. 
So that way you can just kind of see how things were set up and where people would have lived. What I'll also ask is if you do have the opportunity, please subscribe, um, make a comment, rate, whatever your you know um, podcast app or YouTube will allow you to do. What that does is it moves the episode up in um, you know the algorithm so that when people search for keywords about this content, they'll find this more easily. That will just help move the podcast further. So um, all my contact information too is in the description. So if you have any cases that you're interested in, um, you know, you can go ahead and email me or contact me and I'll be happy to explore those. All right, thank you all and I will talk to you soon. Bye.